<clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, next lecture is by Marcel Velinga, who is a professor at Oxford Brooks and who is working now in an amazing project, which he will tell you about too. Right, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by thanking Alejandro and the other organizers for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here, an honor really. Um, and um, when I asked Alejandro what he wanted me to talk about, he said, just talk about the things that you do. So I thought it was a bit, bit dangerous thing to ask really, because as we know, people like to talk when they talk about their own work. So I'll try to keep it brief. I'll do my best. Um, I apologize in advance for the color scheme of the, of the slides, but that's the university's uh, branding. So it's all a bit gray and a bit, bit dull, but there's no way of getting out of that, I'm afraid. Okay, so um, vernacular architecture finds itself in a rather precarious situation all around the world. I think we've heard a few times already today the supposed threats to vernacular architecture in the form of globalization, modernization. Um, there's, of course, demographic changes, population growth, population shifts, migration patterns, there's our environmental change, there's conflict, and all of that has a, a rather detrimental effect on, on a lot of vernacular architecture around the world. But there's also another predicament, I think, it finds itself in, and that is the fact that the concept in itself has been started to be challenged in academic terms. Um, particularly for the assumptions that underlie it and the kind of distinctions or the dichotomies, if you like, that it sets up between us and them, between the past and the future, between global and local. Um, and those are dichotomies that in themselves are, are rather problematic. Um, now, the response of many academics, or people who study vernacular architecture, has been to retreat, if you like, into rather defensive positions, uh, rather static positions sometimes, and also rather purist ideas about what is vernacular architecture and what is not vernacular architecture. Um, but an alternative response, and one that we try to develop at Oxford Brookes, uh, and not just at Oxford Brookes, is to see vernacular architecture not as a static object, um, you know, static buildings that can be conserved, for instance, um, but as dynamic building traditions that it themselves adapt, have always adapted, and will continue to adapt to changing cultural, economic, social, environmental um, circumstances. So when we define a vernacular as a dynamic category, as a heterogeneous category as well, um, and as an adaptive cultural process rather than as a specific building form or building type, um, I think it's possible to move away from some of these perceptions around vernacular architecture and its position in the current world and to, to kind of see how we can actually work with vernacular architecture to, um, to respond to the many social and environmental problems that, that, that it faces. Now, Oxford Brookes, you have quite a long um, history of studying vernacular architecture. When I say quite long, it's, it's about 30, 40 years, I suppose. So in, in, in real terms, maybe that's not that long. Um, and it's mainly associated with the work of the late professor Paul Oliver, who taught at the university for a long time, and um, who, as some of you may know, published quite a lot on vernacular architecture from the 70s onwards. Um, we're very lucky at the moment to have his um, collection as a special collection in the university at Oxford Brooks. So we have his books, which is about six and a half thousand books of vernacular, on vernacular architecture all around the world. And, and um, in itself quite unique in that it brings all these books together in one, one location. Some of the kind of standard classic works, some are really quite unknown and, um, and, and, and in the, from different disciplinary backgrounds, anthropology, archeology, span history, architecture, um, etc. We also have his um, archive, his personal archive, which includes his notebooks, his diaries, his kind of field notes, conference papers, manuscripts for books, etc. Um, so all of that is, is quite a rich um, collection, really, for anybody interested in vernacular architecture. Um, we also have his, um, his images, his image library. Um, throughout his career, he traveled around the world, um, and he took around 22,000 photographs, which in current times is not that much, but when you think about the fact that he started taking them back in 1960 up until 2012, um, it's actually quite, a, quite an impressive record 
of um, vernacular architecture during the second half of the 20th century um, from all around the world. And um, so one of the projects that we're working on at the moment is to try and make that accessible. So since last month, this, these 22,000 images are in fact online. They are accessible for everybody, open access to who wants to use them for re research, teaching or learning. Um, and we're building a crowdsourcing project around that where we're asking people to come and visit the images and add keywords to them so that they can become more searchable, so that we can add new knowledge to the images, and the images in themselves can start to generate knowledge about vernacular architecture during the 20th century. Um, we also did a, um, an exhibition, Architecture for All, um, at the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford a few years ago, and we're hoping that that can, uh, can travel. And that kind of term, architecture for all, kind of embodies, if you like, Paul Oliver's approach to vernacular architecture, how he saw architecture, not just vernacular architecture, as something that belonged to everybody. Everybody creates architecture, everybody uses architecture, everybody lives in and, and some, in some sense has an ownership of architecture. So it shouldn't be exclusive, it shouldn't be restricted to a particular category of people, it should be for everybody. Um, architecture is a cultural product as well, which is the other thing that he stressed, so it's no sense really studying vernacular architecture without looking at the communities that produce the architecture. That, that, that use it and that give meaning to it. Um, and, and, and vernacular architecture has a lot of lessons that can be learned as well, environmental lessons of course, there's a lot of writing about that recently, but also bigger lessons particularly about how people do relate to their built environment. Um, I think it's important to note that in Paul's case that wasn't just his interest wasn't just restricted to vernacular architecture, so even though he is well known for that, he in fact was interested in all built environments around the world, including modern or, or, or postmodern or whatever term we want to use to identify our built environment. And you would say that, that the things that he saw in vernacular architecture in fact apply to all forms of architecture. His, the biggest part of his legacy is the Encyclopedia of Vernacular Architecture of the World, which was published 20 years ago um, and is by now out of print, well, has long been out of print and is also by now uh, rather out of date. So what we've, what we've done recently is to start the second edition of this encyclopedia um, to try and update it, particularly the approaches and theories um, section, which, is, uh, which obviously is uh, 25 years um, out of date now, so that needed um, updating. But we're also updating all the regional entries. So for those of you who don't know the encyclopedia, it's three volumes, about, about uh, 2,500 pages, with brief descriptions of vernacular architecture traditions all around the world, all the continents. Um, so we're updating all those entries, correcting mistakes that might be there, adding new developments that may have taken place, uh, adding new bibliography, uh, new literature to the bibliography, etc. Now this is all the more necessary um, because of the challenges that I mentioned at the beginning, the environmental change, the conflict that has lost, uh, led to a, a loss of vernacular architecture all around the world. Um, the demographic changes that are taking place, and some of them have been referred to this morning already, rural exodus, uh, rapid urbanization, geriatrification or the aging of societies. Um, all those processes have a very direct um, uh, impact on vernacular architecture. Um, and it's important that these are addressed. So we've, we've added a new two volumes that will look at those specific issues of conflict, environmental change, demographic change, etc. We've also added a new um, volume on the consumption of vernacular architecture. So whereas a lot of traditional work on vernacular architecture looks at how vernacular architecture is cre created, how it is produced, we're also looking at how it is consumed. So, for instance, in the shape of um, fridge magnets or, or, or models or postcards or stamps, um, and um, also the way in which it can inspire new design um, and, the, and the way in which it um, is appropriated for all kinds of reasons, um, some more positive, obviously, um, than others. So, all this actually requires in our opinion, a new perspective on what vernacular architecture is, um, one that is more dynamic, as I said, one that is less rooted in the past, uh, and one that acknowledges that vernacular architecture doesn't exist without people, without communities. Identity doesn't exist without people, and therefore it should be people and the agency of those people in creating, maintaining, and, and regenerating vernacular architecture that should be the, um, the emphasis. So that leads me then to the, um, 
teaching that we do on vernacular architecture in, uh, at, at Oxford Brooks. Um, and we do that at the postgraduate level, so it's been mentioned several times, I think, this morning, that in education there's not a lot of attention being paid to this kind of um, architecture. That's true. But at Oxford Brooks we do uh, teach on vernacular architecture at both the postgraduate master's level and also at the PhD um, level. And the uh, program that we have established to do this is, is called International Architectural Regeneration and Development. Now, the premise of this program is that the inherited built environment, and I should stress that that inherited built environment does not just include vernacular or traditional architecture, but can also include other forms of architecture. Modernist architecture that was, say, built 80 years ago is now part of our inherited built environment as well. Um, the ethos of the program is very much to see how that inherited built environment can contribute to tackling the challenges that may be um, found in particular parts of the world. So, in particular, we're looking at, therefore, the transformative potential that architecture may have in tackling bigger issues. So, we're not just interested in conserving vernacular architecture, we're not just in, interested in reusing um, vernacular architecture, we're interested in seeing how doing something with that vernacular architecture can in fact make bigger changes in a, in a, in a community, uh, social, economic, cultural, etc. Um, so we're exploring how we can give new use to vernacular architecture, how we can give new meaning to vernacular architecture so that both the architecture and the culture that it is a part of can remain, um, can remain vibrant. Now we're doing that through a combination. By the way, all the images I show are of, of, of student work. Um, it's a combination of theory and practice. So the first semester, we've got two semesters at Oxford Brooks, is purely dedicated to um, theory, where we're trying to teach students about culture, about identity, about architecture, about tradition, and the nature of those concepts and the way in which we use them, um, their definitions, their possibilities, their shortcomings in some cases as well. We, we, we urge them to be critical, to think, rather than just assume um, to challenge writings, both from the vernacular architecture field as well as from um, other architectural uh, writings, and to, to think outside the box, if you like, so not to be stuck into a, a particular perspective on what vernacular architecture is, what it does and what it should do, but to, to actually allow them to think beyond that and to think what can we do with this vernacular architecture. Um, to, 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 to address these bigger challenges that they, um, that they may, may face. So there's a lot of reading involved. Um, there's a lot of arguing and debating um, involved as well. There are lectures, there are seminars, uh, there are master classes, and there are also some field trips. So through all these kind of different ways of teaching, we try to instill a, a way of critical thinking into the student uh, and, and a critical perspective on vernacular architecture and what it is. Um, so we look, for instance, at the relationship of architecture to culture. We discuss what culture actually is, how that relates to identity, how, how it's different from society. Uh, we look at the historical layers of a culture, um, and we discuss the difficulty, perhaps, of identifying some historical layers as being more authentic um, than others. We look at theories of regeneration and the processes that come with, it, with that, for instance, gentrification. Uh, and we also look at community participation because community, as I said, is effectively what makes, makes the vernacular architecture and what creates the identity. Without those people, there won't be any tradition, there won't be any identity or place identity. In the second semester, then, we take the students on a field trip, normally of a week this year. In fact, we'll be going to Valencia, um, and um, where they carry out research social research, economic research, architectural research. They document a location, they try to identify the problems that that location um, uh, faces. Um, they document the architecture and they start thinking about how their design may contribute to solving those problems. So the theory behind it is very much that design and research kind of happen at the same time. It's very difficult to put in practice in, 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 a, in a university program where we are structured by, by semesters and particular times. But ideally, the students go out there, they do their research, they think about how, they, how their design could solve problems, and they adapt their research to that as well, and that in turn then again uh, adapts their design thinking. Um, 
So when they come back to Oxford, there then is a, a, about a month or so where they, ca where they carry out some group work. As a, as a group, they have to come up with a strategy, uh, an, an overarching strategy for the particular location to identify what the economic problems are, the cultural issues, the social issues, how uh, they can address those and what role design can, can play in that. And that is then followed after four weeks by eight weeks of individual work where we ask them to take on a specific individual or a specific aspect of that group strategy and develop that in more detail. So there could be, say, uh, a strategy to conserve vernacular architecture. It could be the design of a completely new uh, buildings uh, in a vernacular context. It could be the reuse or the regeneration or the refurbishment of existing um, buildings. It could be something completely not to do with architecture at all, really. It could be looking more into the social issues or the economic aspects that underpin, uh, underpin the problems. And a fundamental um, aspect that we stress in all that is, of course, that those issues that vernacular architecture faces are different in every location. They differ per country, they differ per region, they differ per culture, they differ per, per city, village, they can, they can differ per, per street, really. Um, so that's why we try to, as far as we can, go to as many different places um, as we can. And so over the last 10 years, the program has been going for 10 years, we visited uh, various places, not always in a vernacular context. Sometimes we go to the city as well because that's what students want. Um, but we try to kind of combine that one year we go to an urban location, the other, other year we go to a more vernacular, often rural, rural location. So we've been to Romania. Um, where the issues were most, well, quite a few of you will probably be um, familiar with, with, with the situation in Romania, where, where the, the issues facing those communities with transport, housing, healthcare, etc., but particularly the lack of ownership that people felt um, in relation to those vernacular properties, um, and, and the lack of initiative, really, that there was for them to actually maintain these buildings to kind of do them up, to, to, to do something with it, to try and change their, their situation. We went to Cyprus as well, northern Cyprus, the Turkish occupied part, where the situation was in a way similar to Romania. Again, lack of ownership um, led to a lack of initiative, resulting in a situation where people had been living in these houses for 40 years and had not done anything to try and maintain them. So we give the students almost, well, not almost, the impossible task of actually then coming up uh, with a solution to those problems. Obviously, they're not going to come up with a solution to the problem, but they have some good ideas. And in the process of trying and thinking about the location and the issues, they come up with some interesting ideas that maybe can be put into place at a, uh, at a, at a local level. We've been to Spain before, to Ademus in, in Valencia, where the situation was very different from Romania and, uh, and, 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 and Cyprus, and the issue was more like was, what was mentioned this morning, the seasonal nature of the location, so 9,000 9 or 10,000 people living there in the summer and, and less than 1,000 in the winter. What, what do you do with a place like that? Gentrification taking place, people from outside buying up, uh, buying up the properties, leading to questions about whose identity these buildings represent um, in any case. Geriatrification as well, i.e. the process where places become old. The only people that still live there are elderly people. In many cases, the only people that move there are elderly people as well. How do you deal with that? Same issues in terms of gentrification and geriatrification in the Cotswolds in the UK, um, where again, Locals are being displaced by, by newcomers, if you like, from London and from, from the bigger cities and often people of a pensioner's age, um, resulting in very different kind of um, use of the buildings, very different needs uh, of those buildings by the community and how, again, how, how do you deal with heritage in that context? So, in conclusion then, because I saw you already um, showing the three minutes sign, um, I heard this all about trying to understand the context of these buildings. And in, and in that sense, it very much represents, as I said, what we do at Oxford Brook. So we're interested in the vernacular architecture, we're interested in the architecture, in the buildings, um, but we're more interested, if you like, in the social, cultural, economic context around that, and then particularly in how the buildings fit into that context and how the reuse, the conservation, regeneration, sometimes 
destruction of those buildings, taking them out of the equation and replacing them with new buildings, may lead to a change in that context, may lead to the regeneration of communities, uh, economically, socially, culturally, because ultimately, I think, um, often that, that, that is what it is all about. So it's all about the transformative role that vernacular architecture can play in helping places to develop, to continue to move into the future. I know, Robert, what you said, you know, we have, the, we have the past, we have our memories, but people also live in the future, I think, in their minds. It's an imagined future. The past, I think, often is also imagined. Um, people want to do both. I think we're trying to see how the buildings can help people to create something for the future or to help them achieve their imagined future by not forgetting um, the past, by building on the legacy um, that they have, in this case, in the form of vernacular architecture. Okay, that was it. Yeah.